Hello and welcome to this episode of the Millis Podcast, a show about ideas, books and events from the Christian intellectual scene in Australia and beyond. And today we do go beyond Australia for the first time, uh, as you'll see soon. I'm your host, Simon Kennedy, and I'm the director of the Millis Institute and a senior lecturer in humanities at Christian Heritage College in Brisbane. And I'm also a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Queensland. And I'm joined today by uh, Doctors Glanville and Glanville, mm-hmm. sounding a little bit like a sinister kind of musty Dickensian law firm. Uh, but Luke Glanville uh, is Associate Professor in the Department of International Relations at Australian National University. His most recent book is Sharing Responsibility, The History and Future of Protection from Atrocities, published through Princeton University Press just this year. He's also authored uh, the book Sovereignty and the Responsibility to Protect a New History by Chicago University Press, uh, which is a book that I have utilised in my own scholarship. Um, Mark Glanville is Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology at Regent College over in Vancouver, Canada. So he's joining us from a different continent at a different time of day and possibly a different date, Mark, I think, um, as well. I'm not not quite sure, but but it's good to have both Uh, Luke and Mark on and Mark's the author of Adopting the Stranger as Kindred in Deuteronomy published by SBL in 2018 and most recently Freed to be God's Family the book of Exodus um, published through Lexham just this year as well Um, and together they are authors of a new volume with IVP academic entitled Refuge Reimagined Biblical Kinship in Global Politics and that's what we're going to talk about today gentlemen thanks for coming on the Millis podcast it's good to have you on thanks for having us Simon Really good to uh, good to be here, Simon. So you um, both have the same surname, and in fact, your brothers. How did you both end up as academics, uh, and both end up interested in displaced peoples and Christian theology? Because you're both teaching at very different institutions, you have different disciplines, but you've come together to write this book. Do you want to tell us about, I guess, your journey both as brothers, but also individually, and how it's come together in this book? I thought you were going to ask us, how did you both end up as brothers? And I thought that was an interesting topic for conversation too. But it wasn't that question. It was, how did you both end up scholars and writing on forced displacement? So, Different question. Yeah, that's more puzzling. Over to you, Luke. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was, so both of us were jazz musicians back in the uh, early 2000s. Um, and at some point, I um, we were, we were kind of, I was a drummer, Mark's a pianist. Mm. in Sydney at some point I I thought it would probably be good to do some further study in case uh, I wanted to uh, pursue a different career at some point I started studying a master's of international relations and just very quickly just fell in love with research went on and did a PhD mm. um, got an academic job and have loved um, being an academic teacher and researcher most of the last I guess 15 years through the PhD and my academic career so far i've focused on uh international responses to mass atrocities genocides mm-hmm. ethnic cleansing and often at least in the first few years focusing on um how states go beyond their borders to try to stop atrocities or prevent atrocities often through military intervention mm-hmm. um but in recent years increasingly coming to the conclusion that so many of the interventions that states undertake end up not working or even doing more harm than good Mm. and one option that's left on the table is um, actually embracing the victims of these atrocities and welcoming them into one's own country as refugees and so many of those states that talk about military intervention and champion military intervention are so often reluctant to actually care for the vulnerable people that they're so insisted on saving right and so um yeah I, i turned to uh, explore uh, and develop a real interest in rights and responsibilities around refugee protection in more recent years. And that's the res- that's the idea of responsibility to protect. I think, which has become a bit of a uh, like a concept, a big concept in IR. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And and for the most part, that's cast in terms of um, protection being done over there where the atrocities are occurring, mm. trying to prevent them, trying to respond to them, trying to rebuild states in the aftermath right. of atrocities there seems to be an obvious place for refugee protection within that concept, but it's so often um, not thought about hard enough and so often not embraced by states who are, in other respects, trying to champion R2P. Responsibly good, protect. 
No, that's very that's very helpful. And and Mark, I, I take it that you're you've got a similar background in that you were a jazz musician as well, but you've moved into um, working in Christian theology and pastoral work. Do you want to explain how you've come to this to this place as well in writing about this topic? Yeah, I was. I first pastored um, in a, a poor government housing area in west of Sydney, and that's where I started to uh, pastor, and that's where I started my PhD research. And that was very fortunate, I think, um, because I think so much of the Bible is written from the margins rather than from the center of, say, wealth and power and influence. It's often both Old and New Testaments written from quite vulnerable positions. Um, I mean, I was just reading on uh, Paul recently and just the real social humility of being a tent maker. Mm. And that was, that's an example of someone who wrote from a position of tremendous vulnerability and in an unashamed culture, shame. So it was mm. real privilege to me to start my PhD work and, and just to learn to read the Bible with the poor, really, and trying to be a contrastive community um, a light in that area and, and to learn from the dear people who, who are my neighbours. And so when I started my PhD work, um, I, I focused on forced displacement, which was one way that some people, um, my neighbours were, were vulnerable. They were newcomers to Australia and they came here because they, yeah, desperately needed a home that was safe where they, they and their kids could flourish. And I've then moved to Canada and continued to pastor and continued to research and to write. Mm. My wife and I both, Erin um, Gohin Glanville is my mm. wife, and she mm. is also, um, we, we live sort of in solidarity with people who are on the move and we try and be family with our friends and, and to learn from them and to, to love one another, people who are newcomers to Canada now rather than Australia yeah. and seeking a home here and just trying to, yeah, do read the Bible and do my scholarly work. Actually, I'm, I'm an Old Testament scholar. Mm. As an Old Testament scholar and <clears throat> theologist, um, yeah, in solidarity with these people who who have some some real needs. And yeah, so uh, I think that um, I think it's probably that that strong connection of research and praxis that has been formative for me. Yeah, fantastic. No, thanks, gentlemen. That's a really really helpful it's always interesting i think biography is always informative to understand what people's motives are and how they come to the position to do the kind of work that they're doing so that's really helpful um ivp were, were kind enough to send me a copy of your book an e-copy and so i've read through it and, and and one of the big themes in the book is 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 kinship and that 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 comes up in the title of course so basically how i read what you're doing is you're laying down a challenge to the reader to reconsider how they understand this concept concept of, of kinship why is this theme so important for thinking about refugees and displacement from a Christian perspective? Perhaps I could take this um, and throw to Mark for anything he wants to add. I think it's it's worth saying that there's a whole range of uh, languages available to think through Christianly um, ethical issues, including refugee ethics. We could think about refugee ethics in terms of human rights or in languages of human dignity, solidarity, mm. hospitality, sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, all of these are biblical, valuable mm. ways of thinking <clears throat> through this issue. But Mark and I were, became convinced that this language of kinship and this concept of kinship was had the potential to not only be particularly demanding of Western nations, but uh, potentially quite transformative of uh, Western nations in terms of how they conceive their right. engagement with and relations with uh, their vulnerable kin. So we argue in the book that the, the deep narrative structure of scripture continually calls God's people to embrace and enfold vulnerable, marginalized, mm. dishonored, dispossessed, uh, displaced people yeah. as kin, as family. And once you see, as we uh, make the case in the book that kinship is a central concept in both the Old Testament and New Testament worlds for understanding uh, interpersonal relations, economic yeah. relations, political relations. Yeah. It becomes clear that it's probably going to be important to pay attention to what the biblical authors say about the ethics of kinship. Yeah. That's going to tell us a whole lot about how God wants his people to behave. It's probably even going to tell us a whole lot about what it means to be God's people. Mm. And when, as we argue in the book, you start to see that 
the biblical ethic of kinship is one that's relentlessly inclusive of vulnerable outsiders, mm. um, we maybe start to get a sense of um, the fact that kinship ethics has a whole lot to tell us about refugee ethics today. Yeah, very good. Mark, did you want to add, in, add to that at all in terms of just that the biblical concept of kinship informing the, the book's argument? Yeah, I was looking at um, the Pentateuch and the ethical texts in the Pentateuch, and some of them are very famous, some of them are less known, and trying really to make sense of them in terms of that ancient culture. Mm. So, I mean, probably a lot of people on this call may know, uh, for example, the gleaning stipulations, the stipulation to leave the residue of the harvest for the stranger, the orphan, and the widow. Uh, you know, um, you don't go over your field twice, but leave the gleanings, don't go over your, mm. your olive trees twice and so on, don't go over your vineyard twice, but leave but, and many, many other stipulations like that. I was sort of holding 50 or so texts in my mind mm. and just thinking, what, how did the ancient person hear these and make sense of them? What did they mean more deeply than as individual laws? What were they saying? What, mm. was, the, what was the significance of them? And, and as Westerners, I think, you know, we kind of often think in terms of charity to be generous, and then kind of justice activists would say, no, 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 it's more than charity. Don't undersell it. It's justice. It's structural stuff. And that's very, very helpful. Yeah. True. But I don't think that's necessarily way, the way the ancient Mediterraneans, ancient Israelites thought either. Right. Uh, right. Human rights is, is another common category or, you know, in the last 10 years in evangelicalism, hospitality, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of these are helpful. But I was just trying to think. And, and then really that idea of kinship and family um, just dropped into my mind and for for months and even a couple of years i just tried to chew on that and learn about it and mm. once um simon i was invited to take a, a wedding in toronto which is five hours flight from where i live in vancouver um and, and so i just thought okay this is this is it i'm just gonna think about kinship <laughs> for a full weekend yeah. and i'm gonna marry these guys yeah great yeah so, right and so i took these books and I, and I just thought, and I, and I realized, and then Luke and I have done a lot of deep thinking together uh, since this time, that really so many, th th it's a kinship culture and it's a communal culture, the world of the Old Testament and the world of the New Testament, in a way that uh, kind of, if you like, um, Caucasian, at least, Australia isn't, but certainly there could be subcultures in Australia that are more communal. Yeah. And so that so much of the biblical ethical material was heard in terms of, it's almost like code for family. Right. And so one of the key questions that I, I realized that these Old Testament texts are asking and you as well is, who do I have responsibility for? Mm. Who am I to be in solidarity with? And so if there was someone who was poor, if there was an orphan, if there was a widow, if there was a stranger in Old Testament time, well, sure, it was a crisis of not having food to eat. But in terms of biblical theology, it was a crisis of kinship. Yeah. In other words, that these people needed someone who would take responsibility for them. Yeah. They needed somewhere to belong and a clan who would be in solidarity with them and offer that protection that the government wouldn't in ancient times. No, that's right. the, the social security certainly wouldn't in ancient times. Mm -hmm vulnerable people needed a clan it was mm. all about belonging and the way that you subsisted the way that you survived was to belong and so even simple commands like leave the gleanings of the field let alone you know commands like love the stranger are really operating on the field of kinship because in the ancient mediterranean world even beyond israel but including israel if someone wasn't your kin you didn't owe them a thing mm. in fact often you could even kill someone with impunity yeah. You didn't know them a thing. And so when the Bible says even something as simple as leave the gleanings of the field, it's saying treat these people as family, take responsibility for them, give them a place to belong. Yeah. And then look what I just, we were just chewing on this and spent some years really thinking this through, yeah. you know, certainly through scripture, but then also into a theology for the national community and the global community in relation to people on the move. Yeah, very good. Uh, so, so I guess I want to continue that, that line of thought with you, Mark, and ask, um, how do you see this, uh, I guess, old, you've, you've described it as an, you've mainly been working with the Old Testament so far in your answer. I know you've suggested that this is also present in the New Testament, this idea of kinship. How does it apply, do you think, in the church or for the church today? Do you want, can you expand on that a little bit for us? And also, one of the key yeah. themes that comes out of this kinship uh, idea in the book is the idea of feasting, which I think is an excellent theme, which I'd love to hear more about as well in relation to that. 
Yeah, great. Okay, well, let, let's let's speak about feasting and speak about an old old New Testaments in the church, say, and continue this discussion about kinship. Mm. I mean, we could go at one text that we spend time with in our book is Deuteronomy chapter 16, which is a feasting text. We mm. call it, as Old Testament scholars, actually a festival calendar. Deuteronomy 16 unfolds literally uh, the, the calendar harvest rituals as we move from spring to summer through to the fall through to winter and then start all over again and i think many of our listeners may know have heard of the feast of weeks and the feast of booths or tabernacles and mm. if you flip through deuteronomy 16 you'll see that quite emphatically emphatic because it's repeated in israelite feasting vulnerable people are to be included and that includes the stranger the fatherless and the widow mm. And uh, it's emphatic, it's there in Deuteronomy 16, verse 11, repeated again in verse 14, that you're to feast before the Lord your God with the stranger and the fatherless and the widow. And, and it's a very, very uh, celebratory harvest mm. text. It's, it's full of remembrance of the Exodus event and full of the joy of the harvest. Mm. And here we are going to Jerusalem, going to the chosen place, feasting on the best of the produce with the stranger, with the refugee, if, if I may, right there beside us. And this ref refugee, this stranger or the alien or the sojourner, as it's called, depending on your translation, is probably working as cheap labor on, the fa on our family farm. And, and the Bible is saying, uh, no, they're not just to be treated as cheap laborers. They're going to pilgrimage with you mm. to, to the sanctuary. Mm. And when you feast before the Lord your God in worship, they're going to come and they're going to stand before the yep. Lord with you and feast and and feast and celebrate on the joy of the harvest. And without going into too much detail, um, and cultural anthropologists tell us that at feasts, we become family. Right. In other words, at feasts, social arrangements are rearranged and social hierarchies are sometimes even uh, rearranged. And what Deuteronomy 16 and these beautiful feasting texts is doing, it's really ushering in and enfolding the the, these people who need a home mm. into the nuclear family and then of course we could come to the new testament and we could think about jesus fellowship meals and we do a bit of this in our book too and you know new testament scholars have sometimes said that jesus does as much eating in the new testament mm -hmm. as he does teaching yeah. Uh, one New Testament scholar said that Jesus literally eats his way through the gospel. <laughs> and he sort of does. He does be, be, and often Jesus does so much of his teaching yeah. at meals, especially in Luke's gospels, right? And you yeah. know, I used to think to myself, you know, this is remarkable. All this eating that Jesus is doing, and uh, you know that Jesus' fellowship meals, he Jesus himself was reconfiguring family. I mean, mm -hmm. Jesus was famous for eating with all the inverted commas wrong people. But we mm. know in a lot of the biblical story, the right people as Jesus is displaying the kingdom of God. And so, for example, Luke 15, 1 and 2, where the Jewish leaders are, are criticizing and mocking Jesus, this man befriends sinners and eats with them. Mm -hmm. And the problem is not just that Jesus is doing something that is questionable, but Jesus is, is becoming family with these people. And he, he is knitting in together and almost redefining God's family as he does. I used to think to myself, what a remarkable thing that Jesus invented. What a remarkable innovation that we mm. find in the gospels there and then i realized in my own bible reading well actually as jesus eats and feasts with all the the right people wrong people jesus isn't jesus is actually being what israel was always supposed to be right jesus in, in a sense is being uh, the true israel and, and fulfilling the old testament in that sense and uh calling and gathering a people who will follow in his way Mm. in his name and in a similar way uh, display in their shared life the shape of the kingdom of god and that's the church of course yes and jesus was teaching his disciples and modeling to his disciples and in fact forming disciples at those very meals often forming disciples ar around the most vulnerable who were marginalized in that first century greco-roman jewish context and so when we come to the church of course we find our place in the biblical story we don't find our place abstracted from the biblical story. We don't find our place from another story. We find our place in the biblical story. And even as in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, uh, the Torah, of course, in the Old Testament was shaping Old Testament Israel to be this contrastive community, to be this community that shows the rest of the world what it looks like when Yahweh reigns, when the love of Yahweh, the great 
slave emancipator starts to call the shots. And in the New Testament, where we come to the Gospels, for example, Jesus is doing nothing less than gathering the eschatological people of God. Right. That's what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Jesus, you think of the Sermon on the Mount, these disciples sitting around Jesus, Matthew 5, 6, 7, doing nothing less. Jesus is doing nothing less than gathering and mm-hmm. forming and shaping the eschatological people of God. Yeah. And so the eschatological people of God, that is the church, is learning from Jesus the shape of the kingdom of God in line with the Torah, consistent with the Torah, so that we as a church can be that contrasted people that shows the rest of the world what being human is all about. And that displays to the rest of the world the tenderness and the love of Jesus. And not just an individualistic sense, mm. in the sense of just kind of being a, an individual, individualistic holy, holy person. No, no, no. Just as the Torah was all about human life in its completeness. Mm. And just as Jesus showed all of human life in its completeness up close and personal in the Gospels, we too are to attend to every aspect of humanity and every aspect of human society because other after all we serve jesus who is our creator lord and who is loving this world to life yeah that very it's a very helpful expansion and you you've you've applied it i think you've applied it to how this kind of confronts the church today and and gives us an imperative as christians to to try and live this out um somehow um to follow on again and to focus in again on, on jesus uh, eating his way through the Gospels, as it were. In, in chapter three, uh, you discuss how Jesus approaches table fellowship. And this, this is a quote. You say, Jesus upends the current assumptions concerning the great disparity in rank and status between servants and hosts and elite guests. Um, what can we learn as Christians today from Jesus when it comes to helping the stranger in this respect in terms of table fellowship? This is just following on, I guess, from what, from what you were just saying. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke carefully, I think as, as middle-class Westerners, we can be really shocked and we should be shocked. Mm. I think that quote was probably in response to just reading very closely Luke chapter seven, mm-hmm. which is the story of two meals. Jesus is invited to a Pharisee's house and the, the Jewish uh, leaders are jostling for places of honor. And Jesus doesn't only critique them, but he tells the story of another meal, the meal of the kingdom of God. And of course, uh, the, uh, there is a feast and the host invites guests and the elites say, no, we won't come. But then uh, the master sends his servants out and says, go into the highways and the byways, go to those people who are never invited to feasts. go to those people who aren't invited to meals, those people with no honor, and they will come. Mm-hmm. And it's this great reversal. Um, that is the kingdom of God that we see so often in the Gospels, that social hierarchy is turned upside down, yeah. and Christ is found at the bottom, on the bottom rung of mm-hmm. the ladder. And Christ gathers a community, so often starting at the bottom. And so I think that what we see relentlessly in the biblical story, throughout the biblical story, is a bringing the weakest to the center. And, and we find Christ among the weakest, and so it's a tremendous challenge, I think, for middle-class Western churches uh, of a whole variety of cultures. It's a tremendous challenge to, first of all, um, to bring the weakest among us to the centre, to make sure that the weakest in our community are those who are honoured, and to take just make every effort to make sure that the weakest in our neighbourhood are represented in our churches. As, as Christian leaders, um, I think that that means we actually need to think about who we are doing table with in our own households. Mm. Uh, you know, there's no point just say preaching it or writing books about it. Uh, we've got to model it as Jesus did. We've got to follow the great shepherd and change. We have to reconfigure family ourselves. We've got to think who are we kin with? Mm. You know, what, what we see in Jesus is the malleability of kinship. You know, who are my mother and my brothers? Mark three. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, and, and we have to think about the maybe bit of we have to think who are we going to lean into. Of course, we love our blood family, but who are we going to become family within our neighborhood? And can we bring the weakest to the center? And who are we eating with? Who yeah. are we doing Christmas with? In North America, we ask who are we doing Thanksgiving with? Mm. Who are coming to our birthday parties? And are we looking like Jesus did? And then out of that place, calling the church through prayer and through preaching and through modeling, 
to start to display the beauty of the kingdom of God. And that's the place where we can ad we advocate from and speak to society on refugee issues, say. Mm. We don't have authority to speak on refugee issues if we're not, I don't think, in a sense, as a church. Right. We need to model it. And from that place of being transformed ourselves through a genuine encounter of being family, yeah. that yeah. we can start to speak and call society to something better and truer and more beautiful. That's a really powerful challenge. And um, so uh, one, one, and you, you talk about putting it into practice, not just preaching it. Right. Uh, one of the um, illustrations that comes up over and over in the book is the Kinbrace community, which I know that, Mark, you're a part of through your church. Yeah. Uh, Luke, have you visited the Kinbrace community before? What's your, what, can, do you want to summarise what's happening at Kinbrace for us? And as someone coming in from the outside, what's your experience of that, that community? Yeah, I, I was in Vancouver in 2016 when um, Mark and I were planning the book together. Um, I had a lovely opportunity to take a sabbatical and so picked a place where I could be living mm. with my family, with Mark's family um, and attending Mark's church and, and Kin Brace is a community established by the church, what, uh, 20, 25 years ago, Mark? And it's a, it's a housing complex right. where which the church very creatively, imaginatively um, created, established a couple of decades ago mm. for refugee claimants awaiting a decision on their claim for refugee status in Canada. Mm. Um, and, yeah, Mark knows the community much better than I do. I, I only mm. got some glimpses of it here and there and met some of the uh, lovely people within the church working within the community. It just mm. seemed like such a rich environment and a kind of a celebratory environment of this mm. opportunity for the church to um, love refugee claimants, but at the same time be transformed by refugee claimants. But as I say, Mark has much more experience with it than I do. Do you want to explain more about what's uh, what Kinbrace is like what the purpose of it is as well mark and just explain how this is sort of putting this kinship uh idea into into practice yeah grandview church uh, in east vancouver the church where i used to pastor uh, before teaching at region college uh, about some 22 years ago um some key leaders just realized that uh, one of the key vulnerabilities in vancouver is that there was no place for people who walked across the border from america or flew into the the international airport in vancouver as, and then made a refugee claim. There was no place for them to live or be supported. Mm. Uh, there, was no, there was nowhere for them to land, so to speak. Mm. So uh, many were homeless or kind of bouncing between uh, shelters, just enhancing their vulnerability. And so mm. in their wisdom and by God's grace, um, uh, just a generous benefactor was able to buy a house. And, um, and now since then, there's a second house that's adjacent to it. And it's a place for, um, for support and, and housing for around three months as these newcomers go through their refugee claim process. Um, one of the highlights for our family is when it's not the COVID period, there's, there's a community meal on Tuesday evenings. And um, I mean, in fact, my wife and Aaron and I and our kids, um, we haven't been gathering since COVID um, hmm. hit, though Aaron's regularly involved on the board. But um, it's just wonderful on Tuesday evenings when it's not COVID to gather in, in this wonderful multicultural community, um, people taking turns to cook and there's usually 30 or 40 people gathered and it's, it's, a, it's a feast. It's, it's right. just so wonderful. And yeah. um, it's a celebration in the sense that, um, you know, we've survived, you know, and, and we are mm -hmm. surviving together. Yeah. And, and there's a beautiful, Simon, um, there's a beautiful mutual displacement in the sense that, um, for me personally, I sit down at the table opposite someone who, who doesn't speak my language and I don't speak theirs. Yep. And I mean, I mean, certainly they're experiencing a real displacement. But, but in that moment, I experience displacements too because I, I can't have a good conversation. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, neither of us can use our social skills. And, you know, we can point to our kids, you know, and hold up number of fingers or something to represent age. And we, we yep. share in awkward silences and and peaceful silences and and you, that's a blessing hey because we you know i get to grow in that sure. way as well and yeah. experience a limited degree of vulnerability and and perhaps you know powerlessness in a way and it's been a wonderful experience for me too just to um 
to go to the refugee board hearings and to experience something of the um, yeah, the incredible, yeah, just, 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 to, just to walk with our friends as their life's on a knife edge. Will they find a home in Canada? Will they be sent back to this country where their life was right. threatened? And that's been transforming for me as well, you know? So it's a real gift, you know? Yeah, fabulous. It's, it's, a, it's, a, great, it's a great image that comes up over and it's a really good illustration, I think, of what, mm. of what you guys are, are trying to um, put across to your readers. So no, thanks for explaining that further and digging into that for us. Um, I'm going to move to, this, the book sort of has two sections, a sort of a biblical studies exegesis section, and then it goes into a more of a politics angle at the, at, in the second part of the book. And so I'm going to move to some of those questions. Um, and I think, Luke, this is sort of where you major. Uh, so the first, the first thing I wanted to ask you about um, is how does your conception of biblical kinship challenge the typical normative nation-state nation ethic with regard to obligations to others? And the, the second part of the question is why should Christians rethink this in light of the biblical imperative to embrace the stranger and, and the vulnerable? Um, so the first, I guess the first part is about the 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 challenge to the typical nation state ethic and the second parts uh, to do with Christians embracing that. Yeah. I, I feel like over recent centuries, and I, I mean, recent centuries, we're just talking a few hundred years here. We, particularly in the West have taught ourselves to think about political ethics, nation state ethics, uh, by beginning with concepts such as state sovereignty, the territorially yeah. bounded sovereign state, yeah. um, and the absolute right that states have to strictly control their territory, strictly control their borders, strictly control yeah. who gets to come into their territories, who they make citizens and who they don't. Mm. Um, we've taught ourselves that we must prioritize quite absolutely the care of the well-being of our own citizens um, to the point that any concern for foreigners is really um, just mere charity or it's discretionary. It's how generous do we want to be? How benevolent do we want to be at mm. a point in time? It becomes more of a reason of state rather than a, 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 higher, yeah. a higher order thing, right? Yeah, right, right. And as I say, this is really a recent historical construction this mm. way of thinking the sovereign states only and you know this uh very well in your own work simon we're talking 500 years <laughs> five or six hundred years mm. the idea of um the strict control of the boundaries of sovereign state was even even younger we're talking 150 200 years yeah, yeah. not as the 19th century when western states start to enact these anti-immigration laws and and harden their borders and these histories are deeply racist. Like the earliest anti-immigration laws are anti-Chinese immigration laws mm, in the US mm. and Canada. Australia's version of that is the white Australian policy, which, you know, that, that phrase alone tells you all you need to know, really. And that's, that remains in existence until 1960s, 1970s. Yeah. Um, and, and the history of passports and visa controls. Similarly, it's a racist history building on and, and utilising technologies developed for controlling the movement of slaves in the 19th century. And so not only is this a recent historical construction, but it's a problematic, potentially problematic historical construction. Certainly mm -hmm. the roots are disastrously problematic. Yeah. And so it seems lamentable that so many um, Christians in the West, when thinking about refugee issues, thinking about refugee ethics, kind of just reflexively begin with these concepts of sovereignty right. and bordering the control of the entry, constructions born of Western imperial interests, rather than beginning with scripture. And so when you look at scripture, so much of this, this thinking is really turned on its head. Scripture doesn't begin with the territorially bounded political community and the control of borders and mm -hmm. the exclusion of others, and then look to uh, what might be done at the margins of that to enfold certain vulnerable people. No, scripture begins with this call to do justice. Justice, yes, for members of the community, the poor, the orphan, the widow, etc., but also justice for the stranger, the outsider in need of community. And so there's a sense in which, yes, uh, there 
is a place at times for the control of borders and the control of who comes into one's territory. If, if there's a weak state that is vulnerable to predatory or ill-intentioned outsiders wanting to move into their territory, take their territory, extract their resources, there's, there's going to be a need often for those uh, that weaker political community mm. to resist that. Yeah. But we in the West aren't weak. We aren't vulnerable. Yeah. And sure. so our use of our sovereignty, of our territory, of our borders, really should always be about an opportunity, embracing this opportunity to do justice. Yes, justice mm -hmm. for fellow citizens, particularly the vulnerable amongst us, but justice for the stranger, the refugee, the outsider in need. And really, um, yeah, the, the, the purpose of bordering, of the purpose of using our sovereignty, our, our territory, should always be about advancing the cause of justice, including um, justice for our global kin, as we mm. put it in the book. So you're not, you're, you, I, and I, I didn't gather this from the book either, but certainly from what you've suggested now, you're not, you're not saying that there shouldn't be borders per se. It's actually how we use them that's the problem. Is that, is that fair? I think there's a sense in which um, political communities have boundaries mm. typically in some sense or another. Yeah. And yeah, I think you've put it pretty well there. It's, it's what do you do with the uh, limits of the political community? How do you construct those limits? Um, and how do you think about uh, the embrace of those outside those limits? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've, we've, yeah, as I say, we've taught ourselves to think in certain ways about borders. Mm. It's about securing ourselves from outside threats. Um, and it's, it's almost solely about that. Yeah. At the same time, we, um, we don't put up borders to the free flow of capital. <laughs> We're all right. about advancing our interests uh, with looser borders when it comes to, um, yeah, economic gains through trade. But when it comes to vulnerable people, We've taught ourselves that really we need to, the, the initial starting point is no one comes in and then we think about who might we let in. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's not biblical. And that's, it's, it does such enormous harm to vulnerable people in need of community, in need mm. of kinship. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And so, so to, to move to a related question, um, you are quite critical of uh, Christian realism, um, which I might get you to define um, just because then you can kind of set the terms of your answer. Mm -hmm. But particularly I'm thinking of uh, figures like Reinhold Niebuhr and others who were thinking about international relations and ethics and war and conflict earlier mm. in the 20th century mm. and trying to rethink that. And they were doing that I, And it, from, you know, my take is they were doing that uh trying to think th through those things Christianly in light of the kind of pragmatic circumstances they found themselves in. And I, I, you know, cards on the table, I find myself probably in the Christian realist camp. Mm -hmm. And so I found your criticism provocative and challenging to my own view. And I think that's really helpful. So what would you say to someone like me who holds to something of a realist view in international relations? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I was actually teaching um, Christian realism's, Christian realism to my ethics of war students last night and finding myself as I often do very sympathetic to uh, some of the fundamental ideas um, and certainly sympathetic to their, their motivations. People like, like mm. Niebuhr, I think have mm. a beautiful heart for a lot of these things. I think it's worth distinguishing between the Christian realists description of international reality mm. and the Christian realists ethic that they derive from that understanding of reality. I think the right. Christian realist description of reality tends to be quite profound. Yeah. I think it goes wrong in certain ways. And I think of that as an IR scholar yeah. uh, that, um, yeah, we've come to realize certain things uh, that uh, Christian realists have perhaps haven't got completely right. But I think their description is generally profound and, and needs, we need to be reminded of that. But the ethics that they derive from that description, I find disastrously problematic. It's, right. it's And it's used to justify extraordinary um, injustices over right. the years, particularly yep. in the hands of people, political leaders and others who draw on a uh, 
basic understanding of Christian realism and, and perhaps misapply it or just apply it too bluntly. And yeah. so, so Christian, Christian realism emphasizes the reality of human sin, mm. the perils of idealistic projects, the inevitability of international competition and conflict, and that's profound and useful stuff. Um, but I think they draw from this description of international life, mm-hmm. Or one thing they draw is the virtue of each state carefully pursuing its own national interest. Yes. The argument often goes that since the selfishness of other states is unrestrained, our own states need to be selfish too. Mm -hmm. Now, at its best, I think Christian realism offers vital insights that reminds us of our fallen nature, the limits of our understanding, the limits of our capacities. It reminds us of the dangers of seeking to remake the world in our image. And so it calls us to humility. And Christian realists have been particularly quick to condemn Mm. reckless, unjust wars over the years, Vietnam in the 20th century, the Iraq war more recently. It's great. But Christian realism risks encouraging complacency uh, with the status quo and and a willingness for unnecessary moral compromise. One reason I say that is that I think as an IR scholar, the possibilities for neighbor loving behavior in global affairs are far greater than Christian realists tell us. And so because of that, the relentless pursuit of security and economic gain that we so often see in international relations needs to be called out as a choice that's made by political leaders. Mm, That's not a moral necessity. Yeah. Okay. And we shouldn't justify it as a moral necessity. Mm. And so how much, as we argue in the book, how much more beautiful would it be if powerful, wealthy, comfortable states were willing to, ri- to accept some risks and mm. costs for the sake of the vulnerable rather than relentlessly obsessing about their own vulnerability um, and seeking ever greater measures of security and economic advancement. And the church can play a vital role Um, We've seen through history that individual Christians and church communities and domestic and transnational advocacy groups have acted as, as international relations scholars term it, norm entrepreneurs, Mm. um, kind of uh, encouraging and shaping profound change, not only at the domestic, but the international level. An obvious Mm. example, perhaps, is the abolition of the slave trade and the contributions made to that in the 18th, 19th century. Some of these contributions haven't always been in the direction of justice, but some of these contributions have. Um, and so, as I say, the, the church can play a, a really profound role in shaping refugee ethics at the mm-hmm. national and even at the global level. And I don't think we need to um, accept the much more uh, complacent position that Christian realism might direct us towards. It's really helpful and, you know, challenging for someone like me who found, probably found the book over idealistic in the end, but I think it's helpful be what you've said, because it, it shows that actually there's probably even, even if you are a Christian realist, a bit of idealism is probably possibly going to get you a fair way along the, the path that you guys are actually calling, calling us to. I mean, your example of the slave, the abolition of slavery is a good one. I mean, if, if everyone had been a realist, if, if Wilberforce mm-hmm. had been a realist, he wouldn't have bothered doing what he tried to do. Correct. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think that's it. No, that's, it's a really helpful um, and chal- challenging, uh, challenging framework. I think that you've put, put in front of us um, just, just to close what, what, and, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this one. What, what do you want to see happen in response to, to your book? What are some things that you would like to to see people pursue um, in light of what you've what you've put before us in re- refuge reimagined reimagining refuge? Sorry. Uh, yeah, perhaps I'll go first. I think, kind of jumping on what you were saying there, Simon. I, I think what I would love to see some readers come away with is a yeah a, a willingness to rethink their thinking about refugee issues at the Mm. local church level, at the national level, at the global (laughs) level, um, in a way that sees the embrace of refugees as an opportunity rather than an unwanted burden or or even a unwanted responsibility, an opportunity to, to do 
justice, an opportunity to um, get alongside our global kin, mm. and an opportunity that can be celebrated. I, th I think um, in so many Western communities, including Australia, over the last couple of decades, this is a real darkness has come over our national culture and our sense of national identity, as I think we, we tend to understand that we're doing something horrifically wrong with respect to refugees, but we just, we've convinced ourselves that we have to, if mm -hmm. perhaps it's for the sake of our own security or perhaps it's for their security, because we construct these absurd yeah. arguments um, that, that work politically about the need to um, exclude vulnerable outsiders for their own benefit for because otherwise they risk saving their, they, they risk drowning at, at sea, for example, mm. as if us deterring them from coming to Australia means that they aren't vulnerable anymore and aren't right. um, going to be in peril in the hands of people smugglers or what have you elsewhere. I, yeah. As I say, I think there's a darkness that we can relinquish by shifting our disposition towards refugees away from this, anxious, fearful, reflexive response to one that's much more uh, willing to embrace the possibilities of joy and celebration of grasping this opportunity to enfold the vulnerable as kin. Yeah, great. And Mark, what, how, what would you like to see in response to the, to the book? I think for Christians to understand the richness of the biblical story, the way that the biblical story addresses all of life and every aspect of God's world, and even to understand the gospel in all its richness, the gospel comes in the middle of that story as mm. the fulfillment of that story. Christ was raised as the first fruits of this world renewed. And Jesus in his life shows his lordship as the creator, as he raises the dead and calms the storm. For Christians to understand the richness of the biblical story and to understand that as part of the mission of the church is to is to display the healing of the gospel uh, through our witness in life, word and deed. Mm. That's great. Gentlemen, thanks for a really, really interesting conversation, for uh, making a provocative and interesting contribution to biblical ethics, political theology, Christian thinking about public, public and current affairs with this book, uh, Refuge, Re Refuge Reimagined. And thank you both for joining me on the Millis podcast. Thanks so much, Simon. Real joy. That was great. Grateful. Thank you, Simon.